thankful for the rain, but not so much for the, the wind. But uh, we're glad that you're here. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be started tonight. Father, we thank you today for the rain that you sent our way. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to come in your house midweek and to have our batteries recharged and restored and father sustain us through the rest of the week uh father just uh we're here we know you meet with us and uh, we just pray that would open our hearts and allow you to speak to us and teach us tonight in jesus name we pray amen 323 323 at the cross verses one two and five nursing home ministry this morning and this is one of the songs that that uh we sang and becky was there and she, you know when you do that you never know which particular song is it, that they're going to relate to and respond to uh, but this is the one that man they got with it you know i'll fly away mm, just sitting there there's power in the blood and they were clapping and going everywhere so it's kind of neat and fun to do that 329 there is power in the blood <laughs>
like the 320, 320. This is not one that we sing very often, but a beautiful song, and it has a great message to it. Beneath the cross of Jesus, and it talks about, in verse number four, I take, O cross, thy shadow from my abiding place. And I relate that to a friend of mine whose older brother passed away. Uh, Mason was four years younger than Martin, and, and he, he always talked about growing up in the shadow of Martin. And uh, always a second child, you know, how it is that you're the second child. And he grew up in the shadow of Martin, and his brother passed away. He realized that it wasn't a shadow, it was a shield, and how his brother had protected him all of his life. So think about that as we sing that fourth verse, the shadow of the cross. Beneath the cross of Jesus. Notice the second verse, what it had to say about the shadow of the cross. It says, There lies between its shadow there lies beneath its shadow, but on the farther side, the darkness of an awful grave that gapes both deep and, deep and wide. And there between us stands the cross, two arms stretched out to save, like a watchman to a uh, set to guard the way from that eternal grave. Isn't that great? Great. So much theology and so much promise in it of what Jesus did on the cross, preventing us from that awful grave of sin and death and hell. All right. Again, we appreciate you being here tonight. Let me update you on some things in regard to um, your prayer request. First of all, I talked to Lenita this afternoon, and she's encouraged uh, with Rex. He had a good day today. A really, really good day today, and she's encouraged about that. Our son-in-law, Kent, from, and most of you know Kent will be coming down next week to spend a week to help out taking Lenita back and forth to the hospital. But Lenita, dealing with what she's dealing with, her sciatic nerve from her hip to her ankle is, is causing her a lot of pain. And she, she's asked for prayer for herself as well as for Rex, and she's so very much appreciative of our church and the prayers for them and what you've done for them. And she really does miss being at church. So continue to pray for Rex and Lanita. Rex will move from a rehab on Friday and be moving to Good Samaritan. And uh, he'll be uh, there for a minimum at least three weeks and then they will reevaluate. Okay. We saw our friend Miss, Miss Patsy and Miss Patsy may be watching tonight. Uh, she is this I moved her back to ICU today, or yesterday, today, and uh, uh, she's needing a blood transfusion uh, this week, 
and she's also scheduled for a pacemaker at the end of the month, and if they can get her stabled, hopefully they'll do the pacemaker before uh, they release her from the hospital uh, this time. Uh, Dorothy uh, talked with Linda, or Linda sent me a text and said that her mom's not doing any good, and um, but they, she will move from where she's at to uh, Corinth Rehab uh, on Friday. Be going to Corinth Rehab on Corinth Parkway, and she'll be in room 102. And then Francie uh, moved from Select. Uh, she moved last Wednesday, last Monday, and I'm not sure where she moved to. I've forgotten. That's what happens when you get older. Uh, but nevertheless, she's making good progress and has been moved to another facility. And then uh, Cheryl's brother, uh, he goes back tomorrow morning. Is he going back tomorrow morning? And they, they're going to put him under again to, to manipulate his knee, and that will happen at least one more time. Uh, there's a family conflict because he's three weeks ahead of her, and she's been released for four months until he <laughs> doesn't go back, and he's still having to <laughs> have therapy on his knee. So he's not happy with his sister. <laughs> I'm <and> he's <laughs> well, I'm not going to get into that. All right. And then pray for Christie's dad. His name is John Ryan, and he's in Indiana. He's in the hospital. He's got several issues he's dealing with, but they, there's a third lesion, is that correct, on his brain. And so, uh, and because of some medication issues, they're struggling with dealing with that. So pray for Christie's dad, John Ryan, please. All right, that's the updates that I have. Any prayer requests or any praise reports? And we have several praise reports that have been over the past couple of weeks, and we're very, very thankful for that. All right. Nora, let's go first, and then I'll catch Christy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Doing well. Yeah, that's Austin's mom, and they're in North Carolina, and she has had liver cancer. Is that right? Yeah, right, and she's doing well. So thank you for praying for uh, uh, Laura Boyd, and that is an, that's, a, that's a miracle as well as the miracle on the uh, Emory as well. All right, Christy? I got a call from Pastor Jason today. Mm-hmm. He said it's going to take 21 days for her to get over okay. the Yeah, that's a difficult situation. So just p pray for Christy and her grandson and her granddaughter and all of the others involved in that as well. Okay? Anyone else? All right, Peggy. Oh, I'm sorry. Peggy? Okay, what's the name? Campbell, Jonna, a Charlotte. All right. Okay, good deal. Yeah, he had his stint last week, and there's some medication issues that he's having to deal with, but he got a good report. Okay, so yeah. Kathy? Sure, absolutely. Cindy? Mm-hmm. Right. 
Alisa. Or Letha. Okay. All right. All right. A four week old. Okay, at Fort Worth Children's with mine and Jenna's. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Well, let's have prayer and Pastor will come speak. Father, we come to you today uh, thanking you first and foremost for the, the blessings of, of the praise reports that we've heard. Father, we. You've worked in special ways in several of our families here, and, and Father, we thank you for that. In particular, we, th we come to mind in regard to Laura Boyd, and Father, for little Emery as well. Father, we, but we have those that are dealing with lots of things in their lives. There are several families dealing with bereavement. And then, Father, we just call by name each one of these that I mentioned tonight, uh, and every situation is different, but we pray for Rex and Lanita. We pray for Patsy and Dorothy, for Cliff and Francie, for Gary Carrington, for John Ryan, for Aretha, for uh, Peggy's friend, uh, Miss Campbell. We pray for uh, Mark uh, uh, as he's dealing with a lot of issues as well. For Just pray for peace and comfort for him. And then, Father, we just pray for Christy's uh, family, her grandkids, and, and the situation, difficult situations that they are dealing with as well. Father, you, we, you know all. You are the great physician. And we just pray your perfect will. Your per Father, we pray for selfish reasons at times. But we just pray that your perfect will be done in each one of these situations. And that you'd make yourself known to those that love you. And, Father, that, that realize that you are on the throne and you're con in control of situ situations. And, Father, those that don't know you as Lord and Savior, we just again, we just pray that you would manifest yourself unto them. And, Father, that through the situations they're dealing with, the gospel might be presented. And, Father, that people would respond and allow you, the great physician, to change their lives and give them a new heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, David. Thank you, Cheryl. We're back in Proverbs chapter 14 tonight, continuing our path through God's wisdom, His road book to wisdom. That's where we are. How many of you got a chance to see the eclipse? Everybody got to see the eclipse pretty much? Well, I have an eclipse story here in a minute that might eclipse yours. I don't know. It was a famous, <laughs> fabulous, uh, fabulous uh, moment and I'll share that with you. It will not be embellished so if you'll hang with me I've got an interesting uh, eclipse story for you tonight. All right we're going to look at uh, the road map of life and GPS you know the old GPS. Uh, we had to use a GPS to go where we were headed to find the eclipse. We wanted to see the eclipse and my son came into town he flew in from Salt Lake City for this very moment and it had been on my bucket list for many years. I wanted to see a total eclipse. And the only other thing on the list was the Northern Lights. And his girlfriend, Amy, went with us, and she said, I think you need to put some more things on your bucket list. Otherwise, you're going to run out, and you're going to have to kick the bucket. So <laughs> I said, you know, that's probably a good idea. I need to put some more things on my bucket list. But a total eclipse was one of the things we wanted to see. So the night before, we were looking at all the the models and stuff of the cloud cover and this kind of thing and so we were decided we needed to leave here and go somewhere else well, that's always a risk when you do that when you decide well we're going to strike out and go to east texas so our goal was to go to paris texas that was the goal and so you'll see in a minute how this all unfolds but the road map god's road map that's the bible and gps is god's personal uh, sign for you along the way. He's going to show you some things along the way to keep you on the road map. So God always makes things. He has personal service to you. Uh, even though we have the road map, we have the personal service, and the personal service is the Holy Spirit. So we have the Father who is the creator of all, the Son who tells us the road map, shows us the road map, and then we have the GPS, the Holy Spirit, God's personal uh, server, and service to us. Now we're going to look at uh, uh, four different verses in chapter 14 of Proverbs. We're going to begin in verse 9 
And we're going to look at these different roads that people take. Different roads that people take in life. Now beginning in verse 9 it says, Fools mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Fools mock at sin. Uh, the first thing that we see is there's a road, a road that is filled with mocking or mockers. That's a, we could say these are uh, false signs. And what we see here are mockers. Now, what is a mocker? What, is, what does that mean, a mocker? It's someone who ridicules or scoffs at their own remorse. Their own remorse. Because it says that fools mock at sin, but the emphasis of this sin is the guilt of sin. So what they're saying is they're dismissing their guilt. That's a dangerous thing when we dismiss something that's getting our attention. So they're dismissing their guilt. It's a warning sign. It's like a stop sign. I'm going to ignore the stop sign. I see the lights red, but I don't see any traffic coming. I'm going to go through the intersection. And so they dismiss the caution, the danger, even the flashing light of guilt. And that's what they're doing here. These are mockers who are dismissing and ridiculing their own remorse of their sin. And the word sin there means uh, the guilt of their failure. So they're ridiculing or scoffing at the guilt of their failure. They have failed to meet God's requirement, but they dismiss that. And what's replaced with that is what? Self-confidence, self-reliance, and pride. That's all a source of pride. So the dismissing of the guilt of sin is a dismissing of their failure to reach God's goal. Uh, they're dismissing the whole idea of sin. We can see that today. I mean, listen to the things that we see and hear in the news. Listen to the music that we have in our culture. It's all good times and there's no remorse, there's no guilt, there's no consequences. Let's just keep going down the road that we're on. And unfortunately, that road has lots of consequences on it when we mock at sin. When we mock at it, it's going to cause great catastrophe. It's going to cause great heartache and, and, and pain. And uh, it's like the uh, person that you see, uh, you may have grown up with someone like this, who grew up in school, and the teachers were always telling them, you, you need to stay in school, you need to stay focused, and they're always mocking the teacher and not paying attention and always doing their own thing, always dismissing the advice and the guidance of their teachers and counselors. And then comes time for graduation, and they can't graduate, or they have some struggle. And then they get out of school, and they have more troubles. Why? Because they mocked at something that was giving them guidance. Our guilt is a good thing. When we feel guilty, when we know we're wrong, guilt is a great thing to have because it's telling us we're on the wrong road. And a lot of times we think that a guilt-free Christian life is what we should be living for. But guilt reminds us when we get off the road, when we're wrong, on the wrong path. And they're mocking, fools mock at that. That means that's, a people, that's people who are, are empty-minded. Empty-minded people, they laugh, they scoff at guilt. But, man, there, here comes the good news, but here we go, here's a U-turn in that road. Here's what's the road? What's the U-turn in that bad road? The road of mockers. But among the righteous, there is favor. But among the righteous, there is favor. So how do you become righteous? It's going to be a long pause. How do we become righteous? Jesus. He is our righteousness, remember? He clothes us, Paul says, in his righteousness we're clothed in his righteousness jesus is our righteousness now for them what are they looking for they're looking for a messiah king they're looking forward their faith in the old testament is looking to the future our faith is looking at the past and the present we know that jesus historically came we know that he died on a cross for us we know he rose again from the dead we know he ascended into heaven and we know he's a sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf, and therefore, but because of your righteousness in Christ, you're made righteous in Him. What does it say? It says there is favor. Favor. Now, this is a great word in the Hebrew. Favor here means a delightful acceptance. A delightful acceptance. So fools 
empty-headed people ridicule and scoff at their own remorse over the guilt of their failure. But among those who are clothed in God's holiness, righteousness, there is delightful acceptance. Now that's a great uh, expression of God. When we talk about having God's favor, we're looking for delightful acceptance. When you pray for people to have God's favor, we want them to have God's delightful acceptance. We're praying for that right now for uh, Rex. That Rex will have delightful favor, acceptance. That he'll have delightful acceptance by those that are going to determine where he's going to stay next. And that's what they ask us to pray for, is that they'll have that favor, favor with others. So here's the, the false sign, the road of mockers, but there's a U-turn in it. That's called repentance. And when you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, God grants you delightful acceptance. You have his favor. All right, let's look at the next road. Let's go down to verse 14. It says, The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. The backslider. Here's the, a slippery road here. A slippery road. I was driving on a slippery road at 2 o'clock this morning. Going into town. A backslider. What is a backslider? Well, a backslider is a recreant. A recreant. What is a recreant? A recreant is defined as an unfaithful, backstabbing coward. An unfaithful, backstabbing coward. That's what a backslider is. And he's in heart. It says a backslider in heart. He is unfaithful and backstabbing coward. In his thoughts, he has, um, uh, a demi has just a total uh, disrespect for others, has a res disrespect for God, has a res disrespect for his word. He's a backstabbing coward. He's going to backstab people, and he's going to backstab um, God's word. And what is God's word? God's word is Jesus. The word became flesh and and uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, the cowards, what were those at his trial? They were cowards. Look at the Pharisees. They were cowards. They were afraid of Jesus. They were afraid of what Jesus was doing, what Jesus was teaching, what Jesus was saying, and the crowds that were gathering in his presence. They were cowards. They said, we're losing control of our world. We're losing control of these people. They came to the temple, they came to our synagogues, now they're going out in the streets to hear this itinerant preacher, carpenter. And it said, though what? They marveled because he preached with great authority. He knew the word because he is the word. But those, those Pharisees were cowards. Well, how many times have we run into life with cowards? Maybe we've done something cowardly. Maybe we've run away from something. Maybe we ran from a commitment or we ran from some kind of conviction that in our heart we knew was right. And we backslid. That's what a backslider is. It's an apostate. It's someone who's unfaithful. They've abandoned their post. And here's a person who, in heart, it says, the backslider in heart. Well, we know what the heart is. That's the mind, the will, and the emotions. That's what the person is. They are a coward in their thoughts. They're a coward in their actions. And their emotions also are that of fear. And that's what he's saying here. This is a slippery road to be on. He goes, what? Oh, I need to put another P up there. Slippery. Well, that's just a mess. I just need, I need to go take some penmanship before I do any more of this. So it's slippery. That's a slippery road. Sliding. You, know, you ever driven down? You know, we have ice roads out here in the winter every other year, every other winter. And, and it's, it's, it's scary, isn't it? And sometimes you get a little apprehensive. You're like, I don't know if I should take that curve or not. And we start tapping the brakes and start feeling it fishtail a little bit. And it makes us a coward, doesn't it? We're like, well, maybe I should see myself through this. And sometimes some people pull aside and they're just not going to go any further. But it says that the backslider here is a, a coward and will be filled with his own ways. His own ways. So what are his own ways? Well, we know that Jesus is the way, right? But here it says plural, own ways, which means they've departed from the road that God wants them on. They've departed from the true road. Now they're on their own road. They're paving their own roads. 
they decided they're going to start, you know, paving their own direction here. Paving their own roads. Well, let's take a look at that because it says uh, it's its own ways. Well, what is its own ways? Well, this is interesting. The root word in slider, when it says backslider, the root word in that means to hide behind a fence. To hide behind a fence. So a backslider is someone who's hiding behind a fence. They're cowardly and they're hiding they're hiding behind a fence. What is that fence? That fence is built with their own ways, their own pavement, which means their own opinions. They decided to deviate from God's word, God's roadmap. They're no longer trusting God's GPS, God's personal service of direction. And so what are they doing now? They're basing it on their own opinions. It's their own ways. There's a lot of people who live by their own standards, their own ways. And the interesting thing is, you can always change the goalpost. Say, when it's your own goals and it's your own ways, you say, well, you know, that's good enough for me. I'm not going any further. Well, I'm not going to do this. I'm like, ah, you know, I know I've committed for an hour, but 45 minutes is enough. I mean, we compromise. That's what that leads to is compromise. And when a person's a coward, they're always compromisers. And compromising becomes a natural part of a person who lives a cowardly life. They're always compromising. Uh, I, I, I struggled with this when I was growing up with cowardly uh, faith. And one day my Baptist student union director, Skip Noble, looked at me and he said, you know what your problem is? He liked to say that to all of us. You know what your problem is? And I said, here we go. He said, you run from commitment. And I said, no, I don't. He says, yes, you do. He said, you quit everything you get. You run from commitment. Every single thing in your life, you're running from it. And he was right. And why was that? Because commitment, I didn't want to get tied down, man. You know, I, I was living uh, Leonard Skinner's Freebird, you know. I'm just going from town to town. I'm just drifting through. I don't need anything to hold me down. I let my faith fly. Well, faith that's flying is not going anywhere. Faith that's grounded is doing something. It's going somewhere. It's making a difference. But when faith is flighty, it goes from one place to the next, it's never settled, Never, that's why he says in, in Proverbs, uh, Psalm 1, he said that the righteous man is like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water, taking all that life and nutrients and, and living water into it. Well, this is a, a, a slippery person's always slipping away like a fish and getting out of hand and getting back in the water, running off, doing its own thing. Well, that's what this is talking about here. And this is a person who has their own opinions, their own ideas, their own ways, their own standards. Anytime someone sets their own standards, they're going to change it. But look what it says. But, and see, again, there's a good word there for but. But a good man will be satisfied from above. Now, this good man means he's pleasant with God. He's satisfied. He's content with God. So the good man here, the but here is the U-turn, which is a good man means they're, they're satisfied with God. I'm just going to trust His Word. I'm going to trust God for this. I'm going to pray about it, and then I'm going to trust God to give the answer. Now, they're faithfully doing their part of living the Word, conducting themselves with all the wisdom in Proverbs, but they're not looking over and they're not giving up on God's Word. When the challenge comes, or it seems as though we're not going to meet the deadline, it's as if we're going to be too late. That's, that's the person who becomes slippery. That's the one who abandons their post. That's the one who acts cowardly. I'm giving up. I've got to do something. I've got to take care of myself here. I'm, I'm going to go sinking with this ship. This ship's going down. I've I got I to get off this thing. Whereas the good man says, you know what? I'm trusting the Lord. He's going to send a lifeboat. Something's coming. I'm satisfied with God. I'm satisfied with God's word. I'm satisfied with God's road map. I'm satisfied with his GPS system here. I'm trusting God. I'm, I know it. I'm satisfied. And it says he'll be satisfied from above, which means he's content. There's a contentment. The Bible says to be content. Paul says that for us to be content in all situations, right? Well, contentment is not something that we live in today. We don't live in a world of contentment. It's always unsettled. That's why people are so stressed all the time. They can't settle down for anything. They, 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 they're, they're always, there's always a discontent. 
You know, when people say, man, you dissing me. <laughs> well, discontent is just that. It's I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dissolve my contentment. I'm dismissing my contentment. I'm not going to be settled. It goes back to the same thing as the mocker. And now we see the slippery person. Now let's go to the third person here. And let's see what next it says. Verse 22. Do they not go astray who devise evil, but mercy and truth belong to those who devise good? So Proverbs 22 tells us, I mean Proverbs 14 tells us here in verse 22, do they not go astray who devise evil? Well, this is what? This is the road to misdirection. Misdirection. They're straying off the path. You know, we always get these stray cats that come to our house. They decide they like us. Thank you for the canned cat food. I've got one that just laid a litter at our door. And um, so these stray cats are always coming. You know, they all just kind of hang out there for a while. And then when the food runs out, well, they go on someplace else. They drift on. Well, a person who's in misdirection is just like the person who's slippery. They have no ties. They're not, they're not anchored. They're not going to stay. They're straying. They're always getting off the path. And they're easily deceived by temptations on the left and to the right of the road. They're always looking over there and, oh, that looks interesting. Oh, that looks, in, looks good. I think I might try that for a little while. And they're weaving back and forth instead of staying on a straight and narrow. They're constantly like a snake slithering back and forth from the right to the, right to the left, right to the left, left to the right. They're always going back and forth. And I told you that story when I was helping my grandfather with his big tiller out in there and he told me he said just get your eye on that fence post in front of you hold the tiller lean into it and go forward with it and just keep your eye on that post don't look at anything else I said yes sir and got up on that thing and started pulling it pushing it and I was about as big around as the tomato sticks he was going to put in the field because I probably weighed 140 pounds and I was 6'1 and I was just, you know, and I was trying to do this, and I started looking over my shoulder and talking to him, and he goes, no, no, no. And I looked out, and I had just made these rows just like this, back and forth, because I took my eye off what? The goal, the target. Well, see, that's what happens to us when we're in our Christian walk with Jesus. What do we do? We take our eyes off the cross. We take our eyes off the Savior. We start looking over here. Well, maybe that might be good. Maybe I need to go do that. They're strange. And stray animals are always trouble. They always want something, but they don't deliver the goods. They always, stray sheep are the worst. You've got to go rescue them. A sheep cannot find itself back in the fold without a shepherd. And the sheep that strays is the one who is at the greatest risk of predators. So they're easy prey. Even if it's a big ram, if it's strayed from the from the security of the flock, from the shepherd, they're an easy target. And it says, that who, do they not go astray who devise evil? What does that mean to devise? That means to engrave. The word devise means to engrave. It's to etch it in. And it's a, it's a, it takes effort. In other words, this isn't a flighty thought. This is a deliberate, intentional thing that they're doing. They're creating evil. Just as you would take something and engrave a letter in a rock or metal, it takes a lot of effort to do that. What he's saying here is that this, this effort to devise evil is something that they're taking time. It's not just some simple little idea they have in their head, but they're planning it out. This is someone who's planning and working on carrying out evil. And that always is leading to someone in misdirection. They're on the wrong road. They're not doing the right thing. They're in trouble. And he says, do they not go astray? Of course they do. They're off the road. They're not on the right road. Now look at this. But mercy and truth belong to those who devise good. See the contrast here? Each one of these has a contrast. Here it says, but the one who's engraving good, planning and working to do good, what do they have? It says they have two things that are given to them. They have mercy and truth. Well, what's the manifestation of mercy and truth? Again, it comes back to righteousness. 
It's Jesus Christ. Jesus provides us with His Father's mercy because He is the truth. He is the way. He is the truth. And now we're going to see the life. So we're going to travel one more road. So here is one who engraves. So we see mockers, a road of mockers, a road full of false signs. And then you have slippery roads. And now you have a road of misdirection or one that's a straying road. But I want you to go to verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. This is a road of doubts. Now, what I'm about to tell you is not embellished. It's the story of our uh, adventure to go see the great eclipse of 2024, April the 8th. So, as you know, my son's always been my hero. Uh, my caliber of heroes changed after 9-11. Uh, sports, people, and you know, actors and all that, they were my heroes growing up until 9-11. And then I looked and I said, it's the people, the firefighters and the police and the people who lay down their lives, the military, they all put their lives on the line for us so we can have freedom and protection and safety and life. And so anytime we have a police officer in this church or we have someone who's an EMT or someone who's a firefighter, uh, people in our military, we've got veterans in this church, they are always elevated in my mind and heart. I always have the greatest respect for them because they are the true heroes. Because they literally are laying down their lives for us. And they provide for us. Now my son's always been my hero because at the age of four, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And we were told that there was going to be great challenges in front of us and he was going to face all these great challenges. And he did. But... In his little mind growing up, he decided he wasn't going to live in fear, he's going to live in faith. So over time, he went out and played peewee football, and we had to check his blood sugar, you know, between innings, uh, between innings, between um, <laughs> quarters, and we'd go change, check his blood sugar and all that. And then he played basketball. But he really focused on football, and he became a high school standout. He got all kinds of honors and recognition. And he was the only one from his team to go play college ball off, out of football. He was the smallest guy on the team, and yet he was the strongest willed person. And the coach told us, he said, I'd take 10 of him any day because he, he, he's not a quitter. He'll give everything he's got. He said, I'd rather take heart, I'd rather take heart and passion over talent any day. Uh, Chan told me that that was true for her husband as well as a coach. But he's beloved among his college friends, and now he's a successful civil engineer. So I told him that this eclipse was coming, and he and I talked a couple of years ago about we wanted to go somewhere to see an eclipse. So he says, I'm coming to town, I'm coming to town, and we're going to go see the eclipse. So the night before the eclipse, we looked at the weather maps and everything, and they said, it's going to look bad, it's not going to be good in Dallas, and you're going to have to go somewhere else. And this one meteorologist kept saying, you're going to have to thread the needle. He said, if you want to see this eclipse, you're going to have to thread the needle. I said, what is threading the needle, Matthew? He goes, I don't know, but we're going to thread it. I said, okay. So we get out the next day, we take off, and his girlfriend comes to join us, and we're in her truck, and we go off, and she's got a sunroof in it so we can look up and watch the sky as we travel. So we're literally trying to outrun clouds. That's what we're doing. And so we go up through Gainesville, and we get up through Sherman, and then we take a right, and we start heading east, and we're headed for Paris, Texas. That's where we're going. And about halfway between Sherman and Paris, boy, there's a big hole that opens up in the sky. And we're like, well, maybe this is where we need to stop. And Matthew says, I don't know. Now, the, the, it says there are going to be clouds rolling through here. I think we should stay on our course. Let's just keep going to Paris, Texas. I said, I don't know, man. I'm not sure about this. He goes, no, I think that's what we need to do. So Amy, his girlfriend, I made a deal with her when we took her truck. I said, you get three votes to our two. So there's two of us and one of you, and it's your car. So anytime he and I agree on something, if you want to outvote us, you get three votes to our two. So you win every time. So she said, well, we're just going to, we're going to follow his path. I said, okay. Well, then the clouds started getting thicker, darker. And as the closer we got to Paris, the darker it got. And I said, man, I don't know about this. I got quiet at first, and then I started mumbling. 
And I said, you know, I'm not real sure about this. I'm just not real sure about this. I said, um, everybody else is going, they're, they're going west. We're going east. A lot more cars are going west than us. And we stopped this one gas station and got something to drink, got some gas, and, and uh, everybody was heading west. We were heading east. I said, I'm not sure about this, Matthew. I'm not sure about it. He goes, no, we're going to stick with the plan, Dad. We've got to stick with the plan. I said, okay. And she kept saying, his girlfriend Amy kept saying, I trust Matthew. He knows where he's going. So they had me outnumbered two to one. I only had one vote. Amy had three. So, so I had no choice but go along with the ride. So I got quiet and stared out the window. And as we went further, I'm not kidding you, the clouds got so dark it looked like it was raining up ahead. And the headlights were on, and I said, this is not good. And then every now and then it would be a glance. I'd look through the sunroof with my little glasses on, but you didn't even have to have it because you could see it through the cloud. I said, it's half covered. It's half covered. It's, it's two-thirds covered. It's three-quarters covered. And then we're past Paris. We're still going. I said, man, this is not good. And then Matthew says, I know this road seems right. We're going to go north. So we ventured off, and we started going in this new direction. Oh, it seemed right, but it was not right. And it seemed right, so we kept going. And I looked out that sunroof, and I said, oh, Matthew, there's not much left. It's got to be at least 80% covered now. And he looks up, and he says, I see it. I see it. I see a hole in the sky. I see a hole in the sky. I said, okay. So we roll up. About 1.30 before this thing's going to happen, we roll up, and sure enough, there's this big opening in the sky. So we get out, we're starting to put our glasses on. It's like five minutes left, six minutes left, and this big puffy cloud started moving right over the, I mean, the very spot. I said, no, I said, this is my life's joy. I'm wanting to see this. He says, I know where to go. He said, I found it. I said, we're going somewhere else? He said, yeah, just follow <laughs> So we went on CR 3255 in English, Texas, in Red River County. I'm not exaggerating this. This is true. I didn't catch this till we got home. So we turned down this road, and it's, it's so sparsely populated. There's only two houses out there and just cows everywhere. And we're on this old, lonely, dusty road, and it's just us. And we saw this couple out in front of their house. They saw us drive by, and they just kind of did like this and kept looking up, you know. <laughs> Good luck, folks, you know. And we kept going, and there's this cloud shadow right there with us. And he looks up, and he says, Dad, there's a hill up ahead. Let's just get to the top of that hill. It's nothing but sunshine up there. I said, let's go. And when we got to the top of the hill, he stopped the car. We jumped out. We put our glasses on. We saw the last bit, and then it happened. It was the most glorious thing I've ever seen in the natural world. Perfectly clear. Not a single cloud in sight. And we just stood there. In silence, the world became dark in the middle of the day, and there was a sunset that was 360 degrees. And we looked, and we could see Venus and Jupiter and Mars, and we just stood there in awe. And then I heard my son sobbing. His tears were just rolling down his face. He said, it worked. We made it. <laughs> he said, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in nature. I said, it is amazing. That's exactly the picture of Calvary. I didn't recognize it until I got home that night. Everybody went to bed, and I was sitting down, and I was thinking, you know, I'd already prepared this before I went on that trip. And I thought, you know, I was a mocker on that road. I got slippery. I was a coward. I said, let's turn back. And I wanted to stray off the course. 
See, there's a road that seems right to a person, but the end thereof is destruction, is death. And we would have never reached our goal, and we would have never seen the most marvelous sign in the universe of God's faithfulness and his handiwork if, we had tra- if they had listened to me in my mocking, in my slipperiness, cowardliness, and in my desire to take another road, another direction. My son knew what he was doing, and that's what Jesus does for us. And there's a road that does seem right to people. It just seems so right. It seems morally correct in their own eyes. Their opinion, their self-made truth upon their opinion seems to be the thing that's right. But the end of that journey always leads to the destruction of everything that's built, worked for, worked for, set up, and hoped for. The certainty of thinking you're always right is an expression of doubt, and it's justified by our pride. And that's exactly the lesson I learned on that trip. The certainty of thinking you're always right is an expression of doubt justified by our pride. The no, I'm, yeah, I know I'm right attitude is an attitude that many times leads us to destruction of finances, relationships, love, joys, goals, directions, and even the very heart and soul of a person. It dismisses common sense, facts, and truth. My son based his decision on facts and truth. He looked at the maps of the radar, he looked at the facts, and he knew the truth. If we go this direction, we will get to see this. If we go any other direction, it's too late. We can't turn back. If we do, we'll miss it. And he was absolutely right. He threaded the needle that day, and he sewed up what was torn open and sewn up what was shut, needed to be shut, which was my doubt in my mouth. He threaded the needle, and he sewed up my mouth of doubt and slipperiness. That's what Jesus does for us at Calvary. He shuts up our doubts, our self-assurance, our pride when we come to him. And this road, the road of doubt, the but for it, is always if we confess our mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and we confess he's Lord, we shall be saved. He will remove our doubt, and as we confess, he'll replace it with faith and assurance. So tonight, that's my eclipse story. My son's faith eclipsed my opinions, and I'm so glad I'm standing here tonight to tell you I was wrong. And he was right. Jesus is always right. He's never wrong. Jesus is always right. He's never wrong. Father, thank you for this night. We thank you, Lord, that on the roads that we're on, we can make a U-turn. We can repent. We can go in a new direction. We can start fresh. And we can get on the path that you intend for us to be on. Help us, Lord, to get on the path and stay with you. Help us not to look to the right nor to the left. But as Job says, keep looking straight ahead and trusting you. We thank you for your faithfulness and goodness to us. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.